My name is Nadine Christensen, and I am interviewing, interviewing Bob Sprawl for the Veterans History Project in partnership with the Office of Congressman Blake Moore. Today is March 6th, 2023, and we are holding this interview at Davis, Ca what is it? The Davis Catalyst Center. Thank you, the Davis Catalyst Center. <laughs> All right. Hi, Bob. Um, if you can give me a little bit of your background, where you were born, and a little bit about your parents and siblings. Let's see. I was born in St. George, Utah, and um, lived there for the first four years. Uh, spent a little time in Okinawa during those four years. My dad was in the service during the Korean War. And so we spent about 10 months in Okinawa and then uh, moved back to St. George. And uh, I'm uncertain as to why my parents left. I suspect that it's for economic reasons. But they left and we moved to the San Fernando Valley, uh, Reseda, California. And uh, that's where I grew up and went to school. and. Uh, uh, Graduated from high school and went to uh, Pierce Junior College. Uh, I was not a particularly good student. Uh, even though I liked school, the only reason that I went was because that's where my friends were. And so uh, the first year that I went to Pierce Junior College, um, I didn't do too well and uh, decided that uh, I had better uh, think about things and do something different and uh, chose to volunteer for the draft and so I was drafted and uh, my girlfriend did not uh, particularly care for that very much. Uh, she is now my wife <laughs> and anyway uh, six months after I was drafted I found myself in South Vietnam in the Republic uh, and uh, with the 101st Airborne Division and uh, as a uh, infantry soldier. And what about your parents? How did they feel about you enlist or going volunteering uh, to be drafted? They never said much about it. Yeah. Um, my father had been in the military and... Uh, what branch did he serve? He was in the Army. Okay. And uh, so uh, I, I just, I, th I think they were, they were more uh, silent about it because there was really nothing that they could do, you know, because I had volunteered for the yeah. draft and the notice came as a drafted individual. Mm. They couldn't see that I had actually volunteered. And so they didn't know that it was really my decision. And so that nothing could be done once you received that draft notice. You were right. done. You were you were going. And did you have brothers and sisters? Um, I had um, three brothers and a sister, um, and uh, the two of the brothers were much younger. Uh, mm. One seven years younger, and the other fourteen years younger. Uh, I guess my parents had seen the movie The Seven Year Itch, but uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, the age difference was uh, one of those kinds of things where uh, not until we became adults, all of us became adults, that I really get to know those younger brothers and mm -hmm. have a, a closer relationship with them. Mm. And uh, just more of the background, do you, what was life like growing up in the San Fernando Valley and your most vivid memories of the time? Life was great growing up in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, I don't know that I'd want to grow up there now, but at that time it was great. Uh, I'd wake up on a Saturday morning and my mother would never know where I was at until I came home. <laughs> <laughs> after dark many times uh, that old adage that we came home when the street lights went on and that didn't apply to me <laughs> um, I had 
a, a terrific childhood. Even though we didn't have a, a lot of money, it didn't make any difference to me. I, I had a good time no matter where I was at. Mm. And a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of good friends. And besides school, did you hold any jobs before you were? Yeah, you know, uh, you know, the burger stand job and, uh, the, you know, the bus boy and that sort of thing uh, through high school. Um, I played sports and, and so uh, when football season was over with, you know, I would get a job and every, every year I would quit <laughs> and, and for football season and then uh, come back and get another job after that. Um, so you said your father was in the military after your Okinawa. Did he finish his military service? Or? Um, yes, he, however, he, he um, was discharged from the regular military and then he joined the National Guard and spent 20 years in the National Guard, um, in various, you know, uh, assignments and things like that. Mm -hmm. okay. So it wasn't it wasn't a full time situation for mm -hmm. him. And what did he do for his employment? He worked for Howard Hughes. Huh. Okay. Any stories there? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you were drafted, but you were pretty well prepared for that letter to come, and yes, you just volunteered. Yeah. Uh, and since you were drafted, you served in the army. And how did you get to your initial point of entry? Like, where did your training take place, and when did you end up over in Vietnam? Um, I had to report to the LA induction station on June 15th of 1967. And my parents took me down there, dropped me off, and then there were, you know, a ton of kids down there in the same situation. And we went through um, the medical checkup and uh, the uh, all those kinds of things and then uh, we got on buses and they drove us on bus to Fort Ord, California mm -hmm. and we got to Fort Ord, California about three o'clock in the morning and it was raining and we got out of the bus, we're in civilian clothes and they put us in the front, lean, front leaning position which is the you know push-up position mm -hmm. And right there and then I thought, you know, I just don't think this is going to work for me <laughs> as a career or anything else. Um, because I had decided, well, you know, if I get drafted, I have two years. And during those two years, I could determine whether or not this would be, a, you know, a, a, an avenue to pursue for a career. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that first night said, no. You'll do your two years, you'll do what you're told, you'll be a good soldier and everything else, but you're not doing this for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, from that point, we, I went to you know, Fort, the Fort Ord basic training uh, scenario. And, was that uh, six weeks? Or? Uh, it, was, um, it was like eight weeks. Mm. And this was during the time when at, at Fort Ord, and I'm not sure about the other military posts, uh, we had a, uh, uh, an issue with, uh, I can't remember, it's escaping me right now. Uh, but anyways, a quarantine kind of a situation and there were all kinds of regulations. They had to allow you to make sure you got eight hours worth of sleep and that kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, they didn't harass us very much. And after we were done with our training mm -hmm. for the day, we were pretty well uh, okay to go ahead and get everything ready for the next day and then go to bed and not be woken and, and carry, you know, having yeah. to do some silly things and stuff like that. When I got to, when that was over with, I got a two week leave and then I went from there to Fort Polk, Louisiana to uh, what they called Tigerland. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, uh, a, a place where 
um, once you hit Tiger Land, you pretty much knew that you were, your, your next step was going to be Vietnam. Oh. And that's the way it was for most everybody in my uh, AIT, Advanced Infantry Training Company. Mm -hmm. I did not go immediately to Vietnam. I had volunteered to go to jump school. And, and so I had another two week leave after AIT and then to, on to jump school. And uh, jump school was at Fort Benning, uh, Georgia. And that was a three week um, training course. And at the last week you made five jumps uh, and, uh, and it bumped up right up to the 23rd of December. And so they knew that most of us would not be able to find transportation home for Christmas. And so they put us in C-130s, uh, you know, the same aircraft that we jumped from, and uh, flew us to various places in the United States. And uh, the place I went to was Norton Air Force Base in California. My parents picked me up from there and I spent the next 25 days having a good time. And then by uh, January 15th, I was on my way to uh, Vietnam. Mm. Actually, I had already landed in Vietnam January 15th so of 1968. 1968. Yeah, so that would be 15 days before the 1968 Tet Offensive. Yeah. That was a pretty rough time. And you were there? I was there. You want to tell us more about that? <laughs> uh, well, it was just uh, one of those uh, times where um, the NVA and the uh, VC had uh, planned a, a, uh, a la all-out attack on major installations and cities in South Vietnam during their Tet New Year. And um, I think most everybody uh, has seen film after footage after footage of the uh, incidents that occurred in Saigon and, and throughout, the, uh, throughout the time uh, and other, other cities. Uh, at that point in time, I was up in uh, I had been assigned to uh, B Company, first of the 501st, 101st Airborne Division. And we were uh, near the city of Quantry in that area at that particular time, but that all happened. And then about three weeks later, we would be moved down to the city of Wei. That's the old Imperial capital. And, and that's where the Marines were having an, uh, their major battle. Um, and uh, we were uh, on the outskirts of the city uh, doing some um, uh, ambush set up and interdiction of the VC and the MVA coming in and out of the city of Way. Mm. So backing up a little bit, when you were in training for jump school, what would your average day be like? Like, when did you wake up? What? <laughs> um, I think we were up by, you know, five o'clock in the morning uh, for um, breakfast and then uh, get ready. And then I think we were, oh, seven o'clock for formation and then uh, we would run everywhere you went. When jump school, you ran. And then we would run to our uh, training uh, area for the day. And that was the whole routine every day, except for the very last week. The very last week was jump week. And, and then that's when they'd, the very first morning they'd take you out and you'd go through the, the aircraft that you were going to jump from and, and a simulated situation of a jump. And then that afternoon you would make your first jump. And then the next morning, you would get in the aircraft and then you would make a second jump and a third jump and then a third, I mean, a fourth and a fifth jump the following day. And then you had a big ceremony. They pinned the wings on you and that was it. What was that first jump like? Uh, <laughs> it was a bit embar embarrassing for me. <laughs> um, 
<clears throat> I, um, I was right near the door. Uh, and when they opened that door and uh, that rush of wind is, ha, ah, this is really going to happen. <laughs> and um, they had a, a first pass and a ranger, uh, you know, a qualified jumper, a ranger would jump, make that first jump to see how the wind and everything else was. And then they'd make the other pass around. And you always see these movies when I was growing up of guys exiting an, an aircraft and you always saw them for a minute. You know, not a minute, but, you know, a few seconds that looked like, you know, well, whew, he was gone. <laughs> I thought, whoa. And uh, so, uh, you know, the, the training kicks in and you just do exactly what you were told to do. And you stood up and you, you know, went through your equipment check and uh, all of those other things. And then the... Uh, Jump master would tell the first guy, stand in the door. And that guy get up in the door and put his hands on the outside of the aircraft. And then when he got tapped out, the next guy would pass his static line to the jump master. And, uh, and then same scenario. So when I got there, I passed my line to the, st <laughs> the my static line to the jump master. And I put my hands on the outside, and I didn't wait for him to tap me out. I just jumped. <laughs> I just said, there's no, there can't be any hesitation here. I'm out of here. And um, I, I have to tell you, it just scared the heck out of me. But then all of a sudden, I felt this jerk, and I looked up, and my chute was open, and I looked around, and I said, oh, this is great. This is really good. So the next four jumps were, you know, a lot of fun. So do your parachutes open automatically at a certain time, or you... Well, the static line will... Oh. Once you reach the end of your static line, it, it automatically pulls the chute out, and then your chute unfurls. And, of course, mm. if there's a problem with your chute, uh, sometimes those the, the shroud lines will come across the chute and create what uh, the training instructors call the May West. <laughs> <laughs> you know, younger people aren't going to know anything about what May West means. But anyway, and uh, your rate of descent is about twice as fast as it normally would be. Mm. And so um, you, you're instructed to pull your reserve, and your reserve is in the front, and you jump out with your hand right here is where your pull ring is for your reserve. And so you just pull your reserve. The problem is, is that you're not falling fast enough for the wind to catch your chute to put it up. So you actually have to take the chute and throw it up in the air like mm -hmm. that. And so there were probably two or three May Wests during the, all of the jumps. And one of the guys that was, that was probably two or three guys behind me, um, his second jump, he had a May West, and he didn't throw the chute up and so the chute tangled in his feet, and he rode the May West down. It didn't, you know, kill him, but it did. He did break his back, <laughs> and so Ooh, wow. he was he was done. He, in fact, he was done for the, with the military completely after that. But nevertheless, if you threw the chute up, it would pop up, and typically, what would happen would be that because your chute, the second your reserve was up it would uh, many times uh, allow the, the shroud line to exit the main chute, and then all of a sudden you've got two chutes coming down. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and when you volunteered, were there any qualifications? Like, could anybody volunteer? Oh, yeah. Anybody could volunteer. Oh, anybody. Yeah. And did everybody who volunteered finish through the training? Uh, no. Not everybody did. Uh, most, most did though. Mm -hmm. Most of the, the, you know, there's a pride thing, you right. know, and so you're <laughs> going to do it no matter what. You know, you can't be a namby pamby about this. You're going to finish it off. Yeah. And most of the guys, you know, was right away. You know, we're going to do this, and that's no matter what happens, we're 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 going to try to make it through. So you got into Vietnam. Did you do any jumping there? No. 
no, no jumping. No jumping. And so, like, is that normal? Like people who have been trained in one thing, you know, like you're a jumper, but they never used you. Or well, none of, uh, I can't say none of us jumped, but there might have been some that had uh, the opportunity to make a jump. Um, but there wasn't a, a division-wide uh, jump that the 101st did uh, mm. in Vietnam. They did do uh, um, a brigade, the 173rd Brigade did a jump in Vietnam, but it was not during the time that I was there. Mm. It was earlier. Uh, but my recollection is that that might have been the only jumps that were made were, were from the 173rd. Hmm. And, um, oh, do you recall any of your instructors, either in your original training or then AIT training or yeah. jump training? Uh, in jump school, no. no. Jump school was three weeks quick and... You know, um, you, in basic training, we had a, a drill sergeant that was over us all the time, Sergeant Machine, and uh, he was really uh, uh, very strict. Was and that a nickname or was that no? His that name? was his. That was his name, Sergeant Machine, <laughs> and uh, he uh, he was he was good. We I think most everybody liked him, but but he was tough. You mm -hmm. know, he he didn't put up with any nonsense or any of that kind of stuff. And I don't remember the, the uh, drill instructor from um, AIT, but he too was tough, but, but a fair, fair guy, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. Yeah, you felt well prepared? Um, prepared for what? <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. Um, you know, you're with, when the hundred, when I got assigned to the 101st, everybody was jump qualified at that particular time. Uh, later on, not everybody would be jump qualified, and mm. that meant that they weren't, they hadn't gone through jump school. Right. So there was a particular kind of individual that went through jump school, mm -hmm. and uh, and those individuals, in my estimation, uh, you could trust them and count on them right off the bat. Mm. And so when you say, are, were, were we ready? We were ready mentally, but we weren't quite ready um, in terms of uh, what live fire really is all about. But you, you learn real quick and, yeah. you know. And you never wanted to let anybody down. Yeah. Yeah. And so there are things that you would do just to make sure that you never let anybody down. Mm. Yeah. Can you think of examples or stories? Um, We may have to skip that for now. Yeah. Okay. Um, what was the hardest part of the training? I, th I, I think that no matter who you would ask, they would all have a different answer for you. Mm. You know, um, I, th I, I, I never had any trouble with the training physically. Mm -hmm. um, my, I think the, the most difficult thing for me was not to be with my family and my girlfriend, yeah. you know. And I, no matter where I was at, that was probably the, the most difficult issue to deal with, was how do you get through without that support group that you've always had? And of course, those individuals that you make friends with during the training kind of take that burden away from you a little bit. Never mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. 
Right. But nevertheless, you know, you, you get pretty close to those those guys, and uh, and uh, especially in in Vietnam, we you know, we were like brothers. You know, we had our occasional you know differences and things like that. But for the most part, we knew we could count on the guy next to us. Yeah. And and that was always, uh, you know, uh, something that that was a relief. You know, mm -hmm. you know, you know, those guys that got hit knew that there would be somebody that would come for them. Yeah. And and uh, and that was I, I never saw any case where there was anybody who who right. shied away from that mm -hmm. that situation. You yeah. know. And how did you communicate with your family? Uh, letters. Yeah, you know, all letters. Yeah. Um, my girlfriend, who would I would later marry, and I'm still married to, mm -hmm. um, while I was in Vietnam, she wrote to me every single day. Wow. I didn't get a letter every single day. <laughs> For the first 20 days, I didn't get any mail at all. That was a difficult time. <laughs> and all the, all the, and finally when I got all of this mail, everybody cheered, <laughs> you know. And uh, and we were supposed to, uh, you know, destroy our mail afterwards. And I, I didn't. My wife would put a little perfume on the letters, you know. <laughs> and I would keep a letter right here. And any time that I was, uh, you know, feeling a little bit sorry for myself or something, I'd just <laughs> smell that letter. And especially at nighttime, I'd go to sleep. Oh, boy, this is good. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, speaking of that, did you have any, like, good luck things that you carried with you or, you know, little traditionary things <laughs> that you did? Um, I had what they call a rigger's knife. Hmm. A little pocket knife, and I can't even remember this. It's been so long ago how I acquired it, but that was my good luck thing. Hmm. And my my rigger's knife went with me everywhere. And about oh, about two months before I was going to go home, I, I couldn't find it. <laughs> and and and. You have a lot of crazy thoughts when you're 19 years old. You know, you you do you do crazy things and you think crazy things, and and I I just knew that the next time I went to the field I was going to be killed because oh. <laughs> I didn't have my rigorous knife. I mean, I tore everything apart there wow. in our in our tent, and obviously it uh, you know it never came true. But uh, mm -hmm. I never did find the rigorous knife. Wow. Okay, so when you got into Vietnam and you um, you said you were first with a riflery? rifle Rifle company. Mm -hmm. I was a, a rifleman with a rifle company. That was B Company, first of the 501st. And first of the 501st first designates what battalion you, you're with. Oh. And that battalion was with the 2nd Brigade of the 101st Airborne Division. And and uh, we uh, we moved down from I mentioned we were up by Quan Tri. We moved down and we started um, working outside of the city of Way. And during that time, we also built what will become what would have what did become LZ Sally, and that's a kind of a famous place. And uh, it wasn't too far from the city of Way. And uh, and what was its function? LG its function Sally. was to uh, set up artillery, resupply, and be the be the headquarters for the second brigade of the 101st Airborne Division. Mm. And then, uh, when I, I was with them for about oh, 45 days, and then one afternoon, my platoon sergeant came to me and said, "Hey, how'd you like to get out of this outfit?" After 45 days, you've already broken in. You're you're no longer a newbie, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody, you know, trusted you. You you've got good friends now. And and uh, I said, well, what what have you got here for me, Sergeant? He said, well, your orders for that dog outfit have come through. And uh, he said, do you want to stay or do you want to go to 
go to the dogs. And <laughs> so uh, it took me a few, uh, a, a, a bit because, um, you know, I had become close with these, these guys yeah. and I really, I really liked them. And uh, then I thought, well, uh, when I volunteered for the dogs initially, there were three other guys with me that we had all gone to jump school together. And, uh, and they volunteered also. So before and, when we talked, you talked a little bit about how that came about, how you volunteered. Why don't you tell that story about... Did you well, know? when you're assigned to the 101st Airborne Division, at that particular time, uh, you were re they sent you to um, the uh, headquarters for the 1st Brigade, which was located in a city, not in the city, but near the city of Phan Rang. And, uh, and there they had you do what they called P training, and it was really preparatory training. And it was five days of just, you know, going out and, and getting acclimated to the uh, heat and the humidity and, and um, kind of an easier way into what you're eventually going to go into a combat situation uh, with a combat unit. Um, but everybody had to do it. And... Uh, one afternoon after the, the training was over with, we were just sitting around and there were myself and these three friends and, and uh, this uh, sergeant came in and said, hey, I need, you know, I need somebody to go up and help these guys at the 42nd Scout Dog Platoon build a bunker. And we didn't volunteer, but we were volunteered <laughs> uh, by this sergeant. So we went up and um, helped these guys build this bunker. And we, it, it, it went along pretty quickly, and, and we were finished building the bunker. And like all good soldiers, we decided that it would take longer to build this bunker than it actually did. And so we stayed around for another hour or two. And, and just goofed off with them and talked to them. And they, they talked to us about their assignment. And I knew that I was going to a rifle company uh, at that time. And uh, my three friends were going to go to supply companies. And so when they started talking about, okay, with the dogs, you go out for seven days, you come back in for seven days because you had to carry all the food for yourself and your dog for seven days. And so our rucksacks, our packs, um, when we were with the dogs, pushed close to 100 pounds. And, wow. uh, and so... Uh, water, too? Water. We, we carried, uh, let's see, probably eight quarts, sometimes maybe 10 quarts of water. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there was always a stream or something that right. we could get water from. But uh, but it, it once you you throw on all your ammo, a case and a half of C rations, and and everything else that goes with it, you're getting really close to 100 pounds. Eight cans of dog food, 35 packs of Prime, uh, all that w for the dog and for yourself. Uh, so uh, I figured, well, you know, this doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> I'm going to be with a rifle company, and I'm probably going to be walking point and on occasion, and uh, I'm going to be out there for 90 days, and then I'll come in for a three-day stand down, and then I'll go back out for 90 days. And uh, seven days out, seven days in, sounds okay. So I volunteered. I said, what the heck, I'm going to be out there anyways. I might as well get a little bit of a break. And so the other three guys, they went ahead and volunteered too. <laughs> and I thought, oh, you guys are crazy. Uh, but we, uh, we were good friends uh, by that time. And so when it came time to make the decision to either stay with the rifle company or go back to the dogs, I just decided that yeah, I'll get back with my buddies that uh, I went through jump school with and that'll be good. And so that's, that's how I kind of made the decision. The next day, uh, I was headed back to uh, Fan Rang from what we had started was LZ Sally, and um, it took me two days to get back to Fran Fan Rang. And, and, uh, was it that far away? or the No, it just, just you'd have to wait for right transportation, mm -hmm. and, and uh, 
get him over to the Fubai airport and then getting a, uh, you know, a, a cargo flight out. Uh, I think I went to Quignon the first day and then I had to spend the night in Quignon and pick up another cargo f to fly to Fan Rang and then I uh, finally made it back over to, uh, to the uh, uh, dog unit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then uh, we spent, I think it was about three weeks with the dog and uh, by that time, the 101st Airborne Division had consolidated all of their brigades uh, and had moved to uh, what they would call Camp Eagle. And that was a fire, uh, not a, it was a camp. It was, it was much, much more than a fire base right outside of uh, Fubai. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we moved from these nice uh, wooden buildings, uh, the, you know, they weren't, real nice but they were much better than a tent right. at to tents <laughs> and so so uh, we didn't get uh, we didn't get any decent structure until probably the last month I was mm. in country and it, it was uh, you know, so you're living in a tent with a dirt floor and that was better than no tent and yeah. living in in the mud in the in the jungle yeah so tell me about being introduced to your dog and um, it, that was, um, let's see, the first, I, I had another dog, but his, uh, I only had him for two days and he just wouldn't work. They, they thought maybe we'll, we'll try to, you know, resurrect him, but he had retired and he was going to stay retired. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's when I got my dog. His name was Flair, and uh, he was beautiful. He was a beautiful dog, and uh, he too hadn't been, he hadn't had a handler for three or four months, and so the first couple of days, um, he didn't respond real well to everything you know he bump a trip wire and missed the ambush and couldn't find the person hidden in the bush and that kind of thing he, he didn't it was i think a more mental issue for him he I just you know i don't uh, know if there are dog psychologists or not but <laughs> nevertheless he needed a psychologist <laughs> um and so um our vet tech at that time our veterinarian technician uh, pulled me aside and he was getting ready to go home and he said I'm, I've known this dog for a year now and he had been one of the best dogs in our unit uh, I want you to try something to see if he'll respond to this and he said you know your dog's a chow hound and I said yes he is a chow hound his food was gone in two seconds and uh, uh, you know, he didn't even chew it. It was just swallowed. And so he said, you take your dog and you work with him so that you can put him at one end of the kennel enclosure, put his food at the other end of the kennel enclosure, and have him not get that food until you give him the command to go ahead and it's okay to eat. And so we worked on that. And after four days, and I thought this was really a, quite a short period of time to train a dog to do anything, he would sit and stay put and I could leave the kennel and go completely out of his sight and he would not go for his food until I told him to. And then when he did, he got his food and then I cheated and gave him extra. <laughs> <laughs> and so from that point on, uh, all of the training exercises he was just superb. I mean, he just was amazing. Um, and the dogs that came, their training in the United States uh, was when they came to a tripwire, they would stop and they would sit down. He did not stop or sit down. He turned around and put his paws
not to let me go any further. And uh, he was that good with every, every other kind of alert that he could give. If he knew that there was something amiss ahead, he wasn't going to let me go any further. And so uh, it was easy for me uh, to call an alert. Uh, Sometimes uh, there might not have been anything there at that time. But I, I never doubted his, his, uh, his uh, alerts. Um, and, uh, and, and that was difficult sometimes because uh, the company commanders or the platoon leaders that you were working with had to be at a certain point at a certain time during the day. And... Um, if you have stopped them left and right, it's almost like you're call, cl crying wolf. Mm -hmm. And and they would uh, get a little bit annoyed, and then you ran the risk of the company commander saying, no, we're going on. And, and then, you know, if you walk into an ambush, somebody's going to, you know, uh, be killed or wounded severely. And... That's not a good thing. And so I was always really uh, careful about um, holding them up too much and making sure that the dog and, and, and my dog helped me with that. There were some dogs who, who, weren't as, who didn't give as strong of alert that, mm -hmm. that, that my dog gave. And so we were, able to, um, we were able to save a lot of people, you know, and... Um, that um, that made my assignment um, very rewarding. You know, uh, I moved from uh, an infantryman with the assignment of taking lives to a scout dog handler with the assignment of saving lives, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that helped me uh, yeah. with the whole issue of being in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So how would that, how would those, was it seven days out and seven days in? Yeah. And so how would that go? Like you get your assignment or, and how many people, like draw me a picture of it, you know, verbally. Well, um, again, you're dealing with the whole brigade and, uh, and, and everything that goes with that brigade in terms of the combat mission. And so uh, that can spread 30 guys pretty thin. Uh, and so... So there were 30 dog handlers? Y yeah. Approximately. My, between 25 and 30 w during my time, mm -hmm. the, my, my, my 10 months with the, with the unit. Um, the, uh, and then there was a rotation, you know, and it wasn't a strict seven days in seven right. days out. There were times where you might only have gotten five days in and you were back out. Uh, you might get, you know, seven or eight days uh, beyond the, the time. Um, and then the health of your dog was, was also a, a factor in it. Um, but again, you couldn't carry anything more than seven days. And if the dog didn't have, and, and you were cutting the dog's rations to about a third of what he would normally eat, oh. you know. Um, you, he would get one, one uh, can of dog food and five packs of Prime, whereas in regular meal, he might get three cans of dog food, mm. you know, and, and more packs of Prime. But anyway, um, so they, they would quit, you know, they, they just would quit. They're, they're, they're just run down. And so you didn't want to keep a, the dog out any more than he had to. And then when he was back in, uh, you would feed him up real nice and take care of him, and you know, do a little bit of training and uh, and allow him some some free time too. Um, but uh, did you ever play with him? Oh yeah, I played with him all the time. Mm. Yeah, we we had a 
a, a kind of a, a stream that ran close to our, our compound in the back of it. And there was a, a road that, that they had made and a bridge over this stream. And where they had made that bridge, they would kind of dug it out. And so we'd go get up on the road and then we'd jump down into the water with, with the dogs. And, and that was always a lot of fun. He loved playing in the water. And uh, you teach him tricks, you know, and uh, things like, uh, you know, we would, you'd tell the dog to sit and then he'd down and then you'd look at your dog and say, now, and you would do this in front of an old time sergeant, you know, a lifer, we called them. And uh, when I'd say to my dog, I said, Flair, what would you rather be? A lifer in the army or a dead dog? Of course, I'd emphasize the dead dog a little. And then, of course, he'd roll over and play dead dog. I had to teach him how to do dead dog. And during the process of teaching you how to do the dead dog, I got a little frustrated <laughs> with him. And I grabbed him right about here, and laid him down a little f forcefully. Well, he let me know that you don't do that again. <laughs> Pow, he hit me twice. <laughs> and I said, OK, I understand. But after that, he did dead dog without any problem. And it was a lot of fun to harass the lifers, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. So, yeah, we played with them. So it sounds like you had some good communication with Flair. Yeah, yeah, he knew uh, when I, I went on R&R &R, uh, to, to Australia, which was really quite a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, I, I, when I came back, uh, of course, that was seven days, and, and uh, it was actually more than seven days because there was a couple of days of travel time mm -hmm. once you got back in country. And uh, he hadn't eaten very much. And so as soon as he saw me, he got up and he started to jump around, but he was so weakened that he, he just fell down to the ground. And, uh, and so I, I knew that, you know, he had missed me. <laughs> and uh, so I got him fed up again and he was he was just fine and and uh, and then when I left uh, I went out to his dog run and uh, you know and uh, I think he knew hmm. I think he knew I was going and uh, I got in the Jeep and looked back and he was just standing there uh, you know staring And uh, it was really difficult to leave him. Yeah. So did you ever come into a time when there was live fire? And I did. Uh, <clears throat> not every time that you would go out with a unit, you know, that you were going to run into it. But we operated, I would probably uh, say 90% of my missions to the field were with units that were operating in, uh, in or about the Asha Valley. The Asha Valley was an extremely dangerous place. Uh, most people, uh, uh, when you say the Asha Valley, they know. I, I, I can't remember if I was ever actually on the valley floor, but most of the time I was in the mountains surrounding the valley. And uh, that's, where, that's where you would find, you know, that's where Hamburger Hill happened. And, and uh, you know, I've been, I've been one mountain over from, you know, I'm not probably a mile away from where Am Hamburger Hill happened many times, and and it was a major uh, resupply area for uh, the North Vietnamese Army uh, coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, mm. uh, and. Uh, 
not only did our dog support the, the 1st Brigade of the 101st Airborne Division, but we also supported the 3rd Brigade of the 82nd uh, Airborne Division. And uh, there was a, you know, time, this was probably the most notable uh, situation that I was in, um, where I, six out of the seven days that we were out, that I was out with this unit, we encountered, you know, hostile fire. And um, it was, uh, I don't want to use the word exciting, but uh, but it was um, it was kind of nice to see that day after day, uh, my dog saved these guys from walking into ambushes. We came across two hospitals, and you know, we're talking in the middle of the jungle, no roads, no nothing. I mean, you're you can't see from here to across the room. Wow. And we, uh, we came across two hospitals, one major um, bunker complex where hundreds and hundreds of uh, rifles were found and uh, uh, some of them not even out of the packing grease. And mm. I have one in my closet at home. And, uh, and every day, like for six days, we, we had that kind of experience. And uh, when we encountered that um, situation, um, the dog handlers were given the opportunity, once we had had an alert and established, we could fall back. Mm. I never fell back. Mm. I always stayed up front with her, and I just figured I had a better chance of making it than anybody else because of my dog. Yeah. And so uh, uh, my... Slack man, that was a guy that would walk right behind you. And you would be about 30 meters ahead of everybody. Mm. And uh, we encountered several situations where... Was your slack man with the brigade or was he with your dog? No, he was with the, oh. he was with the unit, mm -hmm. you know, that, that we were uh, out with. And uh, he and I became very close and it was... A, it was... Uh, I, I, it, I have to use the word. It was kind of exciting uh, to, to see everything. Yeah, yeah, to see everything coming together under difficult circumstances and everything working the way it's supposed to be. And and there was a lot of uh, uh, a, a lot of weapons and material captured. Uh, we took two prisoners. We uh, and then the thing that we were there for, you know, there was probably 200 NBA that were killed during mm. those that week. And, uh, you know, we didn't have any casualties until the very last, the very last night that I was wow. with them. Uh, and, uh, of course, the, the casualties uh, were not uh, a result of anything that anybody did, somebody just made a mistake in there. You know, there were some casualties. But that's just one incident. Most of the time, I'd say half the time, you didn't see anything. Yeah. You know, you, you, you were just out there, you know, getting your rear end kicked by the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what was the most difficult part of the jungle? I mean, besides that there's ambushes and uh, there were, and again, I'm only going to tell you what my experience right. was. Mm -hmm. And uh, every, most of the time we were on a trail because, you know, if you had the dog, there's no sense in having to cut through jungle because right. the dog's useless then. Mm -hmm. And uh, the trail would go up and the canopy goes up 80 feet, you know. Yeah. And... Uh, so, so there's a, not a whole lot of sunlight that gets down in. It's not dark or anything, but it, when you, you take a picture. It's filtered. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. And uh, there would be these huge spiders <laughs> that would string their web across. And it would be maybe 10 feet high or whatever. And, and they were, you know, they were like this. 
and uh, they were black and yellow, and uh, I hated when I had to go walk underneath one of those. <laughs> you know, nothing was going to happen, but you always think, oh, it's going to drop down on me, yeah. you know. But anyways, that, that was always a, a nuisance. Uh, leeches, hmm. uh, land leeches were just uh, terrible. Oh, I didn't um, know there were such a thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, they were everywhere. How and, big would they be? Oh, they were about this big, hmm. and uh, they were just thousands of them. You know, you had to make sure that your boots were, your pants were tied real close and tucked into your boots, or they'd get in between, in between. your boot and your and your pant, and, and uh, you would never know they were there until all of a sudden you take a look, and you're, you know, you've got a little trickle of blood, and uh, they could go anywhere. You had to be careful with them to getting in the nose of your dog, and most of the oh. time it would be in between their their toes, you know. Oh. So leeches and mosquitoes were probably uh, probably the two top things, along with the fact that. You know, sometimes you'd get into some of that razor grass and it'd just almost shred your fatigue. And, mm. and, uh, Did the mosquitoes carry disease? Malaria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were, and I never had it, any problem with malaria. Um, but I, I was out with individuals in the company and a kid would get malaria. And, and you know, you, if you have to extract him, it, You've, you've got to spend a day cutting an, an LZ. And so comp company commanders did not like that uh, because that prevents them from being where they're supposed to be. And then they've got to call and say, hey, I've got a kid that needs to be medevaced. Um, we'll call you once we get the LZ cut. It, it would take, it's a, you know, a major operation to In cut jungle, an LZ. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, you're blowing trees and and uh, all kinds of undergrowth and so it's not an easy deal and it's time consuming mm -hmm. and of course it lets everybody know where you're at too right i was <laughs> going to say that would make it yeah. make you a bigger target i would think um do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events? Uh, you, you tried to find something funny every day. <laughs> um, and, and typically, you know, you, you could. Uh, we, uh, we, had a, we had to build a bunker for ourselves one time and uh, we were not engineers. Nor were we the best bunker builders, but we thought we would build us a palace. And so we built our bunker and we made it a two story plus a lookout on the top, you know. We, if, if we would, it would have ever had to have used it, uh, it probably would have collapsed on us. <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> there was this big pipe by our by our compound and and it, I I don't know where it had come from. Somebody might have lost it off of a supply truck, but it was huge. It was about this big around and it was probably oh ten fifteen feet. Hmm. And so when we got our bunker built, I noticed it over there. And so I said, Hey, come on over here and let's help me carry this over and we'll put it up on top of our bunker <laughs> like it's a cannon. You know, we're nineteen year old kids and we were kids. You know. Yeah. And so we put it up there, and then they all climbed up onto, onto the bunker and had their arms around each other and everything. And I took a picture of the, of the bunker. And, uh, and we thought it was real funny, and we left it up for a couple of days. And then we were told by our platoon leader that we had to take it down because if, if, the, uh, if the NVA or the VC or whatever got wind of it they may think it was a an artillery piece and center on it for you know for <laughs> something we all thought oh that's a bunch of baloney but we took it, took down, it down you know <laughs> and but it was just things like that every day and we played cards and and had our cheat signs and everything we played whisk and of course you know every partnership is gonna cheat and we had our <laughs> 
signs that we would make if try to tell our partner what kind of cards we had and that kind of thing. And uh, it was it was a lot of it was always a lot of fun, mm -hmm. you know. And what kind of things did you do? Uh, what other things did you do for leisure time or time off? You say you went to Australia. Yeah. Um, did you ever go to a USO show? Or? No. Bob Hope uh, never made it to Camp Beagle while I was there. Uh, he did the year after, mm. but but not while I was there. And uh, we would have uh, occasionally there would be a a uh, indigenous group that would come and play, you know, music and sing. You know, really? uh, yeah, uh, that wasn't the most thrilling thing. <laughs> but you know, we would. Uh, we just find odd things to do. Uh, horseshoes. We had a horseshoe pit and a volleyball net and uh, that sort of thing. So, what would what would you, as you look back on it, what would you say was your best experience and your worst experience? I'd say the time I've talked about with the eighty second. Mm -hmm. That was the best and the worst. Hmm. Uh, I was uh, I was pretty close to the four guys that were killed. Uh, hmm. Not I, I didn't know them, but I mean proximity wise. Oh. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then that not only were there four killed, but there were five that were severely wounded. And, you know. They're gonna legs and arms gone and that sort of thing. Uh, that was a bad night. Yeah. What would your dog do when people were, when the, you know, bullets were flying or? Well, <laughs> dogs are very sensitive to to sound. Sound, yeah. And so most of the time. Uh, and, and that was a, a bit of a, uh, uh, oh, I'm not sure exactly. That was a bit of a liability for me because mm -hmm. if if we got hit and I had to, and I had to shoot, um, my, you know, it, it's very difficult to wow. control your dog and and that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. and uh, there was a time in this six day deal where I had op I had began firing and I was laying down and they brought the M60, that's a machine gun that, uh, you know, and uh, they, the guy dropped right down next to me and the the barrel of the gun was at my head level instead of out in front of me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the heat of the moment, you know, you, you do they're do. just, and they started opening up and of Man, I, I lost some hearing in my left ear here, and and my dog just phew, went straight up in the air. Oh. And so I had to expose myself, grab him, hold him down, cuff his ears, and wow. keep him controlled while while that little firefight went on. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was it was difficult to, to and you know I didn't really there weren't. There weren't too many times where I really needed to, to have to, you know, shoot. At the shoot. Uh, mm -hmm. There were a few times where it was absolutely imperative, but but only a few. Not you know. Normally, you know, I I would open up and then somebody would come up and then I, I would just control my dog. Yeah. You know, keep him from jumping around. Mm hmm. Hmm. Is there any anything else about that nineteen months that comes to mind for a story? I, I mean, I'm going to close it up with the very when you finish, but I'm just thinking: is there anything else in there? Well, I'll, I'll, there was one really good thing that came out of my experience in Vietnam. As I said at the beginning, I was not a very good student, and. Uh, 
I, uh, w when you get within about three months or so of going home, you start talking about, well, everybody starts, well, what are you going to do when you get home? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do here? Da -da -da. And most everybody would say, well, I'm going to go back and go to school. So, you know, I, that, I, that's what I said, too. I was going to go back and go to school. But privately, I was thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Go to school. I'm not a, I'm not a very good student. Uh, it's, uh, you know, what am I going to do? And uh, that, end, that seven days I was with the 82nd, uh, that final night, I, uh, I had uh, put myself in a position where I thought, okay, well, if we, if we get overrun, yeah, I'll just fight until I can't. And, uh, and fortunately, that, that didn't happen, but I got to, to thinking, there's got to be a better way. And that thought stayed with me for several days. There's got to be a better way. And one day I came back from the mess hall. It was a tent. <laughs> it wasn't a hall. It was a tent. But anyway, and there was a book laying on my, my uh, bunk. And I, I uh, asked everybody, and said, hey, who put this book on my book? Nobody knew. And uh, the name of the book was The Blackboard Jungle. Hmm. Uh, for those who don't know about The Blackboard Jungle, it was a story written about a World War II veteran who had become a school teacher. And uh, his first assignment as a school teacher was in an a, a, uh, industrial high school in New York City. And this mm -hmm. would have been in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And at that time, industrial high schools were for the bad kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, I decided to read it, you know, with nothing else to do, read. And I read it and that was the answer to my question. Uh, and I decided then that I would become a school teacher, that education would be that one thing that would allow us to find a better way. And so when I came home, uh, I didn't have any kind of study habits, but I went back to the junior college and I worked real hard and eventually at realized. At Pierce College? Huh? At, at Pierce, Pierce college. college, yeah. And then I went to Cal State Northridge <laughs> and got my degree there and got my teaching certificate. Uh, could not get a job in the LA school system. And so we decided that we would look elsewhere and we looked here in Utah and my wife liked Utah and so I said okay and uh, I got a job working for the Jordan School District oh. and from that point I got my master's degree and then I got my doctorate and uh, and made that my career and uh, and hopefully uh, allowed me to show the kids a better way. Mm -hmm. And um, so I don't know what I would have done had I not had that experience. Yeah. Hmm. Do you recall the day that your service ended and how that day went? Yes, <laughs> I do recall. <laughs> We came home and we uh, landed at Oakland Air Force Base. Uh, we spent, I think, uh, probably two days there processing out. And they finally gave us some dress greens to go home in. And I got in line to get my pay receipt. And uh, 
I wasn't very far in line, but the officers started cutting in front. They could go to the head. And uh, by this time, I was a little impatient uh, with, uh, I was always impatient with officers. I, <laughs> I, I, I respected them, but uh, there were a few that uh, I didn't care for. And uh, anyway, I, uh, <laughs> I was standing in line and they kept getting in front, getting in front. And, and I said, I'm going to knock the next one that gets out. I'm going to knock him out. <laughs> and there was one right behind me. He did not come around in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> I got my pay, went over. We caught a cab to the San Francisco airport. I bought a first class ticket, to, which only I think was maybe 15 or $20 yeah. back then. <laughs> And I called my girlfriend and I said, uh, do you, can you meet me at the, uh, she didn't know exactly when I was coming home, can you meet me at the airport in 45 minutes? Because that's all Is it would take. LA? LA, LA, LAX. Mm -hmm. And so she said, yeah. So I uh, boarded the plane and came home. I uh, probably had seen too many war movies when I was a kid and so uh, there was a certain way I wanted to come home <laughs> and uh, I, I uh, we went down she picked me up and we went down to uh, Santa Monica Beach and uh, watched the sunset and then we drove up to Panga Canyon and went over to the San Fernando Valley and and I got home right at six o'clock my parents didn't know I was coming home oh. and so my plan was to walk in the door and I just walked in the door and my dad was laying on the couch watching TV and I looked at him and said, hey dad, what's for dinner? <laughs> oh. And your mom? <laughs> yeah, my mom, well, my, my mother was in the tub oh. and I could hear her splashing around <laughs> trying to uh, get out of the tub. She heard your voice. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So that's how I came home. And how long was it before you got married? Uh, let's see. I came home in 19, January of 1969, and we didn't get married till July of 1971. Oh. Yeah. She finished happening. school. She was going to UCLA, and she oh, okay. finished school. She was the smart one of the group. <laughs> And uh, and helped me a lot to uh, brush up on the skills that I needed to mm -hmm. to have to, in order to be successful. And during that time, you went back to school and started your degree. Yeah, yeah. I came home in January, and by February, I was back in school at mm -hmm. Pierce. You know. And what kind of um, like? readjustments to civilian life did you did you notice some was it yeah. different I, I had to quit swearing <laughs> <laughs> uh, that wasn't very difficult um, but it was uh, you know uh, it was it was the adjustment was a lot harder and I didn't even really know that what was happening to me uh, and I had had a friend that had come home. Our tours overlapped a month. Mm -hmm. I never did get to see him. I wrote him some letters. I asked him, hey, why don't you stay, Tom? And he said, are you kidding? <laughs> and, uh, and so when I got home, I, I, he and I were close friends again and, and a couple of other guys. And, and uh, I didn't realize uh, anything about PTSD. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was a kind of an anger issue that that I had to, to I had to be careful with, and I didn't know what was happening, and I didn't get any any help for it until you know I was in my fifties, yeah. and uh, so that that was a a problem. But the whole idea of uh, uh, just not having to, to be af afraid or not having to be 
you know, w was difficult to overlook. You know, you're always looking, you're always a little anxious about, uh, you know, what's happening around you. Uh, you pick up some crazy habits about, you know, not wanting to sit with your back to the door and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. That was all part of it. And, and you know, back then I think most, most vets that had that experience didn't know exactly what was happening to yeah. them, and but, but you know you, you, uh, uh, you had a you, you you, for me anyway, I had that uh, better way, yeah. as as a as a uh, a goal to help me to work hard and to keep, um, uh, to keep pressing no matter how bad things might appear here and there at times you just had to keep it up because mm -hmm. you were convinced that that was the better way right. you kept that forward momentum yeah and and so it was you know it was easy to stay out of those traps by being in the library and <laughs> studying <laughs> and, and 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 being you know in involved with this with this getting yourself through college yeah how um, how did other people receive you? Like the Vietnam War had its controversial things. Did yes. You... Um, well, I learned <laughs> I learned to keep my mouth shut mm. in in all of my classes that I would go to, uh, and uh, you know. Uh, there were things that came up in my in some of my classes that, uh, you know, I could have raised my hand and said, "Yeah, I, I have firsthand knowledge about that." Yeah. That I chose not to say I had firsthand knowledge about mm -hmm. that. Um, I I felt a little disappointed that uh, that we weren't treated like those coming home from World War II. Yeah. I felt a little disappointed about that. Um, I didn't seek for that kind of homecoming or mm -hmm. that kind of thing, um, but I felt like um, there was a lot of people who didn't understand me mm -hmm. and I felt like I was in a position not to allow them to understand me mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, uh, no one ever really treated me poorly. I didn't get the, oh, your baby killer thing. I didn't yeah. get spit on or anything like that at all. Mm -hmm. The friends that I had post uh, Vietnam and, were still the friends I had had pre Vietnam, mm -hmm. and they were all very. You know, supportive of me, and and, and some uh, of them had served. Well, well. and I, in fact, most of them had mm. uh, that. That uh, you know, my two closest friends that I lived with for the, those two years before I got married, they hadn't been, but they were very, you know, uh, mm -hmm. they were very supportive, and they fooled around with me every once in a while and teased me about certain things, and <laughs> I'd be sleeping in the bed, and one of them would come in and yell, "Fire in the hole!" You know, oh. and then I'd you know go, and then he'd say, nice. "Gotcha," <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, you know, I that was okay. I didn't mind that, <laughs> you know. And do you think that your service in the military affected the way you relate to others, or? you know, how you face life differently. I mean, you say education-wise, you decided on that. Yeah. Were there any other things? Um, I, I, think it, I think it did uh, substantially. Uh, um, I think that it made me less tolerant of people who wanted to be victims. Hmm. Um, you know, there's no baby here. There's no crying. Mm -hmm. uh, you you haven't done anything, or that kind of you know. 
thing you don't deserve yet to be a victim. Yeah. <laughs> there, there was that attitude that probably was not uh, the best for myself to portray, but nevertheless, that's the way it was. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, and later, uh, after I retired, most of my career in education was spent in administration. And I, I only taught for three years and then I went into the administrative end of it. And I, I always said when I retired, I wanted to go back in the classroom. Mm. And I did. When I retired, I went back into the classroom and I taught seventh graders. And I, I loved teaching those kids. Uh, but I, I would tell them right up front, there's no crying in this class. There's no complaining because I'm not going to listen to it. And... Furthermore, if you don't think I'm very sympathetic and you want to go home and whine to your parents and your parents want to come in, well, that's great. Have them come in. I'll have, be more than happy to talk to them. <laughs> you need to understand that I don't need this job anymore and we're going to do things my way. But if we do things my way, I'll guarantee you that you will have fun every single day you come to my class. We will have some kind of fun providing you're doing it my way. Providing you're being students, as soon as you cross that threshold into my classroom, you're a student. You're not some little wild seventh grader out there in the hall. And the kids were wonderful. Mm. They came in, they did what they were told, and we had fun every single day. That's marvelous. <clears throat> did you, uh, was your education paid for by GI bills? And um, I didn't, I didn't, uh, start the GI Bill until I started my master's degree. Mm. And then I used it for my master's degree and the very last month of my doctoral studies was used as, and that was the end of it. All I had to do was defend my dissertation and I, you know, it was You're done. done yeah. And so those, those two degrees were paid for by the government. Mm. Uh, but before that, I didn't need to. Uh, in California... It was like $33 a semester. Well, f back in, in 1969, it was $12.75 <laughs> at Pierce College <laughs> per semester. Mm. And then when I went to Cal State Northridge, it was $90 mm. a semester. And so, uh, you know, education was very cheap and... Uh, I was working full time. It, it, at Pierce, I could work full time and go to school full time, oh. uh, but at Northridge, uh, you know, I had to cut back on the on the hours, hours I, I that I that I went to school. So I, I went three quarter time there, and and uh, and then the company that I was working for paid paid for my tuition. Oh, so I got pretty much a free ride. That's good. <laughs> you know, it helps. Um, so here's a reflection question. How has your military service impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? <sighs> I'm going to go a, a roundabout. Okay. When I, when I went to Vietnam, uh, I truly believed that it was incumbent upon all free men to help others extricate themselves from the bonds of tyranny, okay? Mm -hmm. I still believe that. But they have to want to be extricated. And that's what I learned in Vietnam. Uh, I didn't have a great deal of contact with the civilian population, um, except for when I was with that rifle company. Uh, we were working in the you know, in the lowlands and when I went with the dog. So for 10 months I was in the jungle with nobody right. other than, you know, unfriendly. And then for that 45 days I was with uh, the uh, B Company, I, I, uh, we were contacting civilians all the time, coming in contact with civilians all the time. And I noticed at that point in time that I wasn't sure that they wanted their life to change. Mm. Uh, you know, they were f farmers pretty much and uh, okay and 
as long as nobody was hurting them or anything like that, they were they seemed to be fine. Mm. And so that was the first thing I, I thought. I still believe that we still, but they, they need to want to be able to do it themselves. And here comes the second thing. And, and I, I, I want to say this before I say it. I love my country. I mean, I love this country as much as anybody loves this country. And um, I'm proud of most of what we've done. But um, if you're going to go to war, I want, I want it to be a war that the government and that the people at home will commit to. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go over there and have 58,000 guys killed just to pull out in 10 years and not gain or not have extricated them from the bands of tyranny, right. you know. And so I, I need to have a government that will support um, that same feeling. Uh, and I'm not sure that I have the government or the, or the, the people behind it. We may have it to begin with, but then when things when it's prolonged or get prolonged and more and more uh, we begin to give up, uh, I, I, uh, I, that, that bothers me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that, has, that was definitely a situation that, that you know, I learned in Vietnam. So as we fought in Vietnam, I think most veterans that were in combat situations may have had that same feeling that I had, but knew that what they were doing right now, right then and there, was keeping the guy next to you alive. Mm -hmm. And he was keeping you alive. Mm -hmm. And that was the most important thing. It wasn't whether or not we were going to extricate the South Vietnamese from the North. Mm -hmm. It was, we're going to keep each keep other each alive other and alive. get home. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully that is understandable. Yeah, I think so. And what message would you like to leave for future generations who will listen to this interview? Is there anything you would like to <laughs> leave <laughs> to them? Um, I, there's lots of things. Um, I, I had a high school teacher. Um, his name was Mr. Davidson. And he told us one day in class that there was three things that you need to have in, in your occupation. First is you have to like it. The second is it has to give you free time to enjoy your life. And the third is it has to have a salary to allow you to have the free time to enjoy your life. Education gave me two of those things. <laughs> But I think it's important that, that you have goals, that you have uh, an opportunity to, to enjoy yourself, your family, your friends, to enjoy this wonderful country that we have. Uh, I think it's important that you work hard uh, and that you tell the truth. Uh, because if you don't tell the truth, much of that will disappear eventually for you. And so those are the things that, um, that I, I learned in Vietnam. We, we had to tell each other the truth. We had to be there for each other. We had to enjoy each other, um, even through difficult times, even though sometimes we didn't enjoy each other. Mm -hmm. But it always had to, you, you know, you always had to be able to say, hey, I'm sorry, I'll take care of it. Or you always had to be able to say, I'm sorry, I'll take care of it without having to say it mm. uh, by doing things for that individual or group or whatever it might be. Um, so I think those things are important. Um, I, I can't, uh, I, I don't tolerate victims very well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think you need to, no matter what it, what your situation is, you need to make the best of it. 
and, and to help others make the best of their situation and not be totally dependent upon whoever or whatever for your happiness. You, you be dependent upon yourself for your own happiness. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you gain happiness by taking care of other people and being kind and honest and, and brave. And do you think education plays a big role in that? I do. I think it plays a huge role in, in that. Uh, and uh, I think it's important that uh, we understand that as educators, we're all educators at some point in time, that, um, that we understand that responsibility and that we're brave enough to take care of it. Mm -hmm. I think maybe two more questions. One is, what do you wish more people knew about veterans? And the other, is there anything else you would like to talk about? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I never thought about that first question about what I think people ought to know about veterans. Uh, hmm. Well, they're just regular people. <laughs> they're, they're, in most cases, just like everyone else. Um, if you took the veteran population and if you took the regular population, there are elements of each and each population. There are, there, there are victims and, and veterans. There are... Uh, angry, uh, there are, you know, people who don't want to help, who want to be left alone and, and that kind of thing. And I think if you separate the two groups, I think you'll find the same categories that you find in civilians, you'll find in veterans also. Mm -hmm. uh, so and I, I suppose we're not any different than anybody else. And in closing, is there anything else that you would like to add? Any stories that you want to have told or? Mm. Uh, I think I've pretty well covered it. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, I was, I was honored to be able to do this. Uh, and if I, if I was physically capable, I would, and if the challenge came again, I would do it again. Hmm. Uh, I might be a little bit better at it the second time around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some things would change. I happen to notice on your um, biographical data here that you have some recognition. Where did it go? Oh, down there. Bronze Star Valor, Bronze Star Meritorious, an Army Commendation Medal. Would you like to say anything about those? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with those. Okay. Well, thank you for your time today. And it's been an enjoyable discussion. Thank you. Me too.